Hey Carl, uh, Sam, laying on her back, shot straight up and did 25 points of damage. That's how he got injured. Poor Jake was shooting at the ones that were in the cave still because Hex's gun kept jamming. That's Amy with the fan in the background making electronic noise, correcting a detail, maybe, in the Deadlands Guano Happens game. I, the way I recall it, the creature was already injured, and I can't remember if Jake or Sam injured it, uh, but I had to soak some, and I know when Sam was on her back, shooting up in the air in desperation and hitting the creature and then exploding on the damage for 25 points, that was enough to finish it because I had no more bennies. I need to call in and get bennies, don't I? Carl, just caught your latest episode. Uh, great recap of our Dungeon Crawl Classics. Thanks again for running it. I really enjoyed playing uh, the, uh, the cleric, the priest, as you mentioned. Um, and looking forward to the next session. So it was, it was great to hang out with you guys and, and play. Hopefully, hopefully our missing player will be able to join us next time. Anyway, have a good week. I'll talk to you later. Hey, BJ. Thanks for playing and thanks for calling in. Yeah, it did start out slow, but it ended up pretty interesting. Um, we'll see what that mystery, how that mystery unfolds of the enameled portal with three different locations and what more can your priest of Amentor discover. So far, like, you know, we know one goes to a, a ring stone structure in the forest, another one goes to an oasis in the desert, and one seems to be underground. Hmm. So we'll see how these things go, which portal you all take, whether or not the fourth player joins us, and what will befall the players um, when we continue our formal halt DCC fantasy campaign. Oh, as an aside, it was, was really cool is that I um, asked for some clarification or some information on something from the author of the products that we're using, and he sent me some unpublished material to clarify which is really neat. So that's uh, uh, Gabor Lux, who um, runs the first D20 Hungarian Society, and uh, EMDT, I think is what it's called. So um, it's a pretty neat little group of zines, and I like the the funkiness and the flavor. And, you know, I might add, right, so Fomalhaut system is a trinary star system. So if you were to look onto the sky, into the sky of this place, it's a very interesting system. There is some sort of accretion disk between the primary and the, it's maybe about you know several AU units out, um, and which lights up pretty interestingly, like an as if Falmahalt were this this kind of eye, and when you look at it. And then there's two other, there's a, I think there's a, a small, a smaller secondary, several AU units out, and then even further out is a red dwarf. So there's kind of like two, uh, three suns, I guess, um, in this world or system, if we're thinking about it. And probably when, you know, cataclysms occur, when they both sort of line up, or two of them line up, and even bigger cataclysms might occur when all three line up, whenever that happens. Although, I believe that when I was looking at it, I think it's like the orbit of the third has only happened maybe once in the lifetime of the main Fomalhaut star. Um, so, what's interesting too is that there's probably a lot of dust in the air. There's probably some things that caught, that hit the ground often from the sky, meteorites, <laughs> duh, what's it called? Um, it seems like, according to the astronomy, at least one of the, the, the sort of planetary bodies that they had discovered or viewed disappeared, so they suspect that it kind of blew up or got hit by something. So uh, maybe there is, in fact, Maybe, in fact, the broken moon is not quite a broken moon, but it's sort of a, the remnant of, um, of a planet. 
Um, who knows? Very interesting, interesting uh, astronomical features for this world. So I guess I'll have to figure that out and play it up. Anyway, I'll talk to you later. And uh, yeah, thanks again for playing. Okay, I wanted to clarify some of the astronomical data that I gave. So Fomalhaut is surrounded by several debris disks. There's an inner disk at 0.1 AU from the star, a disk of larger particles, 0.4 to 1 AU of the star. So that would be just in the hot zone of this star. It's a little bigger, blue star, Vagan-like. Um, and then our sun. But so the habitable zone would be a little further out than 1 AU. I think the habitable zone seems to be, uh, let's see, probably about 1.1 AU or so. Uh, maybe a little further out. So there is a the belt that kind of shows up in images is an, a dust belt that is, well, there's actually like a 10 AU belt too. So um, then there is also a inner main and main belt outer halo that ranges from 35 to, the inner belt is 35 to 133 AU, so pretty big. The belt itself is 133 to 158 AU. And then there's a halo, 158 to 209 AU. And they think or they thought within the last 10 years or so that the weirdness of the dust disk, that why it's so big between 35 and 209 AU is that there's some large planet, um, Jupiter or Saturn size, um, that is dragging particles in its weird eccentric orbit. I don't know if that's been disproved or not yet. I'll have to do some further information. So its companion star is pretty far out. It's actually 0.91 light years out away from Fomalhaut. So it would still it'd be a, you'd see it, you'd see like these large, they probably would still be, they'd be pretty, pretty large at night, depending. Yeah, I don't know. I have to figure that out. How, you know, what they, would you see them during the day? When would you see them during the day? Maybe, I think you'd only see one of them because the other one is kind of below the plane or at a weird angle. So sometimes you'd see it, sometimes you wouldn't. So Fomalhaut B, which is also called TW Pisces Austrini, is a, a smaller star. Um, it's a flare type star known as a BY Draconis variable. So over 10, a 10 day period, it kind of flares up and down like a red M type dwarf, which is interesting. And then the last one, Fomalhaut C, is pretty far out. It is about 3.2 light years from TWPSA. So actually, actually in a different constellation. Hmm. So it's 1.9. It's still within the tidal radius of the Fomalhaut system because of its binary nature. But I guess they kind of make it a trinary star. So you'd see this other red dwarf type star in the sky. Pretty interesting. And that one might be variable too because of its odd. It's not on the same plane. It's like at a, like at a about six degrees away from A and B. So interesting. I don't know if that helps at all. Uh, it's a weird system and uh, I don't know how that will come into gameplay. For sure like all the, these accretion disks cause a lot of meteorites or other debris to fall. Um, maybe it's not very stable. Maybe perhaps there's cataclysms that have occurred and that's why there are a lot of ruins everywhere especially in the deserts and maybe that's why there are a lot of deserts in this world. Who knows? Except for that forest place with the rings. Hey Carl, just calling in to get my bennies for the next Deadlands game. Um, if you want to institute bennies for Twilight 2000, I'd be happy to get those too. And as far as 
your session recaps. They're great. Really enjoyed the Guano recap. As far as Warhammer uh, Fantasy 4E, yeah, you know, I wasn't saying your game wasn't greedy. I wasn't degrading your players. That was not my intent. I think your campaign sounds awesome. I love your session recap. Sounds like you have a great bunch of players. And I'm kind of jealous. I, I can't play in that group because I don't live in San Antonio, you know. If you were going to run 4E online, I'll happily play it. And just because somebody else on the internet said that 4E is a cleaned up, simplified version of 2E, thus the kitty version, doesn't mean I probably should have repeated that. Not everything we see on the internet we should repeat, right? So I didn't mean to offend anybody, but definitely check me down for the bennies. And the song is Death Clock. I guess I don't recall a song being played. Hmm. To listen back. Maybe there was a song in the background. I don't even know what the song was in the background. If there was music in the background, usually Amy has Alexa play some old-timey piano saloon music. So uh, it kind of mirrors uh, what's going on in the game. So yeah, hmm. Maybe you might need some bennies or an extra Benny for Deadlands um, since you called in. Should I make that a thing? I don't know. Or XP a thing. I don't know if there's like a hero point mechanic in Twilight 2000. I know we have the push mechanic for like a meta currency that you can push the roll and incur stress. And I think if you, there might be if you challenge one of your morals or put your life in danger for your buddy, that might be like the hero point equivalent thingy that you can do in the game, but uh, usually that will be like giving you an increase in the die type for a particular roll, not a re-roll. Hmm. Something to consider. So, yeah, I don't think your character needs bennies in ETU. He already has like super lucky. So he has like five bennies to start. Normally it's three. Um, I don't know. It's pretty cool. Uh, to play Warhammer Fantasy 4th Edition, and I'd like to get you into a game. I know there's some interest on the Discord, so we'll have to try to schedule it and figure it out. Maybe if something else peters out, or uh, I could start thinking of one and making a Roll20 or some other VTT for it, and having it ready as a backup. I do have, like, several backup games, but, like, uh, you know, I need to be more prepared to run them if some game falls through. I mean, I know I could easily pick up, like, America if you wanted to pick up Broken Lands because that's kind of easy. We just have to figure out where we left off, right? Um, man, you know what? Like, another game I have on the virtual that is a really cool map is Other Dust. I don't know, and I could just restart it, you know, from the beginning, the opening adventure, and run through Other Dust at least. So, yeah, there's quite a few... Roll 20s that I have already set up. But um, hey, at, at least we're tackling the list. I can scratch one thing off the list the DCC Fantasy. Um, however long it plays as a mini campaign or not, it'd be, it's fun to do in this FOMO Halt setting. Um, so there you go. One off the list of like 21, but I think something is going to get added. I just haven't had a chance to go up there. There was a notification or request for like a Space Marine game, Warhammer 40k, um, maybe Wrath and Glory, the new version. So uh, we'll see. All right, take care, Jason. Talk to you soon. What's up, Carl? It's Arlen. Really enjoying all of the recaps on the podcast. Glad you enjoyed the Ash Valuria game. We might need to tinker with the XP a little bit um, because right now everybody's going up basically every session and it should probably slow down a little bit at some point. But, um, of course, it'll slow down naturally on some level as we get higher level and the XP requirements are higher. But anyway, um, yeah, it's really good stuff on the Geomologist Presents. Great to hear um, Amy and your other players on the the show calling in about Deadlands. Um, and, uh, yeah, just really enjoying the, the stuff you're putting out. So thanks, man. And I'll talk to you soon. You know, it's a curious thing about the XP. I mean, I think it's fine in the early initially, and we'll see if it kind of you 
evens out. I mean, my character has gotten enough XP to actually be one more level higher <clears throat> than the current level because thieves are pretty easy to advance. So um, I think probably the next time we play, the next, you know, he'll go up and then he'll not go up for some time. So it'll, it'll probably balance out. I think the next one, the next adventure, unless we, you know, get a lot of treasure and a lot of magic and kill a lot of things. Um, it won't, but we'll see. You never know what happens. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's that because of all the treasure? Maybe. I'm, I'm not sure. Or you're not dividing it. Um, I mean, I, I know when I was running uh, my Hyperborea game, what I didn't do, I think I did not divide treasure. No. I didn't divide monsters, but I divided treasure. And that seemed to be okay and give everyone the satisfaction of advancement like once every other or every third session. Yeah, it's a curious balancing act. There's some people who like modern games where you advance, advance, advance. There's some people who don't care. There's some and some people who like the slow advancement because they enjoy the story and what's going on. <coughs> Excuse me. I think uh, most people want some sort of advancement. For example, they don't like the advancement, how slow it is or non-existent it is in Traveler. I've had reports of that. I don't want to play Traveler because I never advance. Kind of do. You get more gear and money and you space truck all over the place and gain more prestige, but it's not like your skills advance or your attributes advance. And then I guess that level advancement, that's the appeal. If there's like a codified advancement system you have you set goals right as opposed to in other games where you literally set goals and you try to hit them and those are the milestones in the campaign as opposed to i reach level three right the milestone is we rescue my horse the milestone is we save the city we find out what the hell is going on in this country um so it's a very different style of play but uh yeah you know that's why we play these different games. That's why I like playing those different games, because I like to explore those differences. And I guess you do too, since you're always tweaking and rolling and advancing uh, the design in your particular games or in a particular game. So I'm glad people like the recaps. It's fun to get um, Amy and the crew to comment some. It was, a, like they said, a pretty harrowing adventure. They felt I was trying to kill them, but it was just the way things worked, you know? And sometimes that happens, too. Like, I don't think you were trying to kill my character. That just happened. I don't think Joe, you'll hear later, was trying to kill my character, but it just happens, you know? And hey, my character survived, thanks to that rum. Rum's important. Don't get rid of the rum. Yesterday, I had the privilege to join in with some folks to playtest part of Joe Salvatore of Raven God Games' Reaver game system. I actually had a really good time, even though my player character got jacked up pretty good. I really enjoyed the mechanic. It's a combination of a D20 system for combat, a dice chain for attribute checks, and what I really like is this resolve mechanic where you can spend some resolve and that's your luck and fortitude and fate in a way and uh, do some cool things and and it's a really neat interplay with this resolve mechanic between because if you spend resolve then the GM gets resolve as well so I like that kind of cool back and forth um, makes for a very dynamic play and there were three players. One was a fighter, uh, one was a roguish type, and myself, I played a shaman named Askold, who's a uh, Hibernian shaman, so Germanic tribe shaman, um, who's part of sort of a client of the main polity in the area, or the tribe is at least, they're not antagonistic. So we all started in a tavern, 
there's a lot of tension in town between rival factions and people start arguing in this uh, ta tavern cafe and it comes to blows it becomes a big brawl um, I put some patrons to sleep with my shaman powers to try to diffuse it but it is goes on and uh, some of the characters actually uh, draw blood get injured as daggers are drawn at some point there definitely seems to be more subterfuge going on one of the people that Brutus is allied with some people are trying to, some rogues are trying to sneak up and stab this person but uh, my character probably not smartly intervenes shoulders him into the wall um, gets the attention of the person they're trying to to like sneak up on and murder but then the next round I get stabbed in the belly and go down so uh, Joe rolled a crit ha huh. so um, I did survive however there's a way that if you spend resolve and the rogue character type can give you resolve so I only had six resolve out of the ten I started with and I had to borrow some resolve from the rogue um, but I was I survived and they we dragged ourselves out of there um, if you do do that, however, you lose some resolve as part of your, your kind of your reduction in fate. You're, you're sort of uh, testing those powers. So I lost a total of three resolve. So now I only have a seven max out of ten that I started with. But uh, we essentially, uh, we heard that things got worse uh, as people tried to stab um, our ally Others successfully took out the, our rival, and a huge riot ensued. So the other character, uh, Brutus, the rogue character, he um, found out some information and came back and said, we got to get out of here. There's an army outside, blah, blah, blah. It's a big coup that's going on. So we escaped town, and that's kind of where we stopped. So it was pretty fun, good session. I think we're going to continue to help Joe playtest the system. Uh, what I liked is we had a big discussion on some of the mechanics um, at the end and what worked and what didn't, which is really fun to me uh, to get into that. So I'll put the information for Joe Salvatore and Raven God Games in the show notes. He's done some other uh, design. Uh, you probably are familiar with him if you played Eldritch Tales. It's an um, old school type uh, Call of Cthulhu mythos game. So um, anyway... That is Reavers, Spears in the Mist. Oh, I have a correction to the recap. Apparently we did not leave town, but that was a sort of flashback at the beginning of the game where we look back on the burning town. But um, apparently we haven't left and we might do some sort of heist in town while the chaos is around. This past evening, I continued with our Starfinder adventure path, Horizons of the Vast. The first adventure in that adventure path is called Planetfall. And in the last part of the adventure, the players had... Uh, this is the third session. In the last adventure, the players landed, had some encounters, dealt with some problems in the settlement, and started the settlement, called it Lake Town. So we play every two weeks on the Wednesday. So this was the third session, like I said. And today we started some exploration. And it was a little slow because the rules, I don't know, um, maybe I'm losing it. But I felt like I read the rules, but then when I reread them, I read them different. But uh, we figured it out. We figured out how to do both the travel to, the recon through, and clearing a hex, there's a procedure for that, so that then later on during the settlement phase, the charter phase, it's called, we can maybe add a hex to exploit for resources or do other projects. So the players, I gave them the option to get a vehicle, but they decided not to, and they decided to go up on, go on foot. So they went into a forest hex that was northeast of the settlement hex. 
and all these hexes are in the adventure. It definitely is like a hex exploration and a hex crawl, which is kind of cool. And that's the idea. So they explored this one hex. They had a couple encounters. The first encounter was with a swarm of, of small predators that they dealt with. And then they continued on in the hex because there's a certain cost to the amount of travel. And, the, and you have an action economy in the hex based on your movement through. And if you want to be thorough and recon it, for settlement purposes or charter purpose, re, uh, charter use purposes, you have to do the recon, which costs double effectively. So they did a, and the recon also can help you be more thorough. So you could clear it out faster, um, by, or you can be more careful and uh, you don't have as many encounters. Uh, that, that's the idea. And then there's, there is a, a table in, in the module where you roll for whether an encounter happens or not. And it can go up or down by plus two or minus two, depending if you recon or not. And the whether you have an encounter, the DC that you roll in the D20 depends on the terrain. So there's really no like survival or other things that the players do. They just spend the actions to do X, Y, or Z, which is unlike, I feel it's unlike Kingmaker. Maybe they wanted to make it easier or because of the technology um, or the, this place has been designated and not, I don't know. You don't have to do like survival through an uncharted territory like I've done in other, even Starfinder adventures. In one, in one, the second book of the adventure path, I believe they were in this jungle um, on one of the planets in the main the pack world system and they had to do like this survival thing every day but not this time there are other things you can do if they get more actions then they can you know look for food or make a camp but they just wanted to re explore and recon this time around so they did that in this forest hex they ran into another encounter and it, and uh, what i decided to do actually i don't know i don't like i don't think i feel sometimes in these newer adventures they don't take advantage of a cool table that you have in the OSR called the reaction table. And it seems like in all these new fangled adventures, everything is hostile and everything attacks. And I know that that shouldn't always be the case and that um, leaves, there's one character who's a, a diplomat um, and he hasn't been able to do any diplomacy because everything's hostile. So I decided I was going to use the reaction table um, that we see in many old old type games. So 2d6 result, right? So if it's, a, if it's snake eyes, it's immediate attack. If it's three, it's hostile. Four to five, unfriendly. Neutral, six to eight, friendly. Nine to ten, agreeable. Eleven, twelve or more is affable. So the second encounter, I rolled that the creature was just neutral, kind of disinterested or uncertain about what to do. So the players did not attack it. It was some sort of Instead of an owl bear, it was an owl lynx, so a, they called it a lynx acute, um, so which was interesting. So they actually, there's a mechanic where you can use survival to, to have an animal handling type of thing, and it was a juvenile lynx acute, so I let it happen, and the player rolled, and now they have a lynx acute that they can train, which I think is kind of neat, it's different. Um, he's like, I think the play, this player, it's funny, he's definitely optimizes his characters and is known for, for that, but he also likes to collect pets, I've noticed, in his games. It's kind of funny. Anyway, so uh, they, have a, they have this pet. They continue exploring the hex. There's no other encounters. Um, a couple of them got a little bit injured. One, one during the swarm, he tossed a grenade and it landed. It didn't go as far as he wanted, so it, even though it disrupted the swarm, it also hurt him, which was also a little funny. So I guess it ended up kind of a cool session, the little few hilarious moments. And then uh, the final part of the session, they went to another hex and they found a meteorite crater, but some local flora that they had encountered before these uh, jolt vines were there, and they had to deal with three of them, which was a tough extended combat. Some players got down to hit points, but uh, they survived. Uh, this time it was five of them on three instead of 
three of them on one big one. So I think it worked out pretty well. And they explored that hex. Um, they were able to... The meteorite was given a bulk of 12. Maybe it's supposed to be 120. I don't know. But they it was full of... They analyzed it and it was full of like rich minerals and rare earth elements. So uh, yeah, the Vesk... Uh, Duke, is it? Yeah, the Vesk uh, Dutch. I mean, not Duke. Duke is a dog. So Dutch picked it up and carried it. So uh, they finished explore exploring that hex. They got back to the settlement and we left it where there was an explosion in the settlement. They can see the smoke. Um, one of the... Um, Security, one of the Naur security, so it's like a minotaur type creature. Actually, one character said, oh, it's a tauren, which is, you know, World of Warcraft reference. So uh, the security guards, get one of the security guards ran up to them, oh, I'm so glad you're here. There's an explosion at this guy's uh, laboratory. So they're running you to go check that out. It's so all in all, it's a good session, pretty productive. I think it'll go faster once we get the exploration and understand the rules. I can't wait to do a charter. It's only been like two weeks um, the first settlement, you know, the settlement from a week that they started and then they decided to go to set the help, the settlers set things up and then, uh, go out into the wilderness and explore like they're supposed to. So now they've come back with the meteorite to get some credit for that. And now they got to deal with some settlement problems, but that's kind of the way the module is written. It's kind of, it's interesting in that you can go out and explore <laughs> Or you, and you come back and there's a settlement event or two that may or may not happen. And then sometimes, depending on the hex you explore, you trigger an event when you come back to town, which is interesting. So um, there you go. That is Starfinder, Horizon of the Vast, Planetfall. Session recap for session number three of it.